Well, good evening. Welcome to the Lessons of Vietnam show, uh, where we try to tell the real story of the Vietnam uh, War and the men and women who were involved in it. Uh, let's start ahead and start with our first slide here, uh, the Lessons of Vietnam show. Uh, I am your host, Bill Dixon, uh, Vietnam 67-68, doing Tet. Uh, we're broadcast courtesy of Nissan Communications, uh, World Headquarters here in Raleigh. Uh, if you have, want to reach out to me with suggestions, comments, or to be a guest, uh, that's my email address, DixonBill80. Be sure and get the 80 in there at yahoo.com. To participate during the show uh, while we're live, make any comments or suggestions or whatever, uh, you can dial 919. 518-9773, or even better yet, go to Skype, Computers 2K Voice. That's Computers 2 with a big K, Voice. Or 919-518-9773. Okay, moving right along. Uh, if you are a veteran or you know a veteran in your family or whatever that's um, – uh, we're coming to the holiday season right now. There's a lot of stress out there for everybody, but uh, sometimes special for veterans. Uh, encourage you to reach out to this number, 1-800-273-8255, and be sure to press 1. And there's a, there's someone on the other end of the line willing to and wanting to talk to them. Uh, there's help out there. You just got to reach out for it. So it's there. Uh, tonight's show is um, some area of, of Vietnam I didn't know a whole lot about, and I was right there close to it. During the war, there were the uh, war zones were divided up into four corps. Now, we hear a lot about uh, uh, First Corps because it was right up there on the uh, DMZ. Uh, we hear a lot about the, uh, uh, the Two Corps because it was the Central Highlands, and, of course, Three Corps was right there around Saigon, and even though Saigon it had its own uh, separate place, but three core, which is where I was at Long Bend, and then you had four core, which we'll be talking about tonight. Uh, one, or I core, was the most northernmost region of South Vietnam, border of North Vietnam and the Vietnamese DMZ. Uh, these five provinces are, and those five provinces in I core were uh, Quang Tri province, which is one of the most bombed uh, places in the history of warfare, uh, Kaysan, which we all know about, uh, from the Marines being there, Dong Ha, which is uh, right on the DMZ, Dong Ha Bridge, uh, Quang Tri City. Uh, if you've seen the show uh, very long, you realize that I can't pronounce half these words, uh, but um, uh, we're going to say in Wei Province and Phu Bai and Wei City, Quang Nam Province, uh, which is part of Da Nang, all right there in I Corps. But you can see how they're broken down on the long thing right there. And uh, by the way, what you were seeing, uh, or the red part was where the uh, uh, Agent Orange and other herbicides were uh, were sprayed. So that's what you see when you see that. So that's what that slide actually shows. But all right, let's just talk about uh, Two Core was the second Allied tactical zone in South Vietnam. It included the Central Highlands and Central Lowlands and was known Politically, as the Central Vietnam Highlands, one of the four major administrative political units of South Vietnam in the 1960s and early 70s. Two Corps was also known as Military Region 2. Uh, that is where, if you hear about the Montagnards, uh, that's where they were located. Uh, some of the greatest allies we've ever had. Uh, they worked quite closely with the uh, Special Forces uh, there in Two Corps. So the, uh, you can see uh, Two Corps Tactical Zone. Uh, there, and it covers a lot of territory. Uh, it has hills in that area. It also has starts getting flat in, in that area. So uh, that's the two core region. Now let's talk about the three core. Three core was uh, activated in September 1959 in uh, uh, of this, uh, the, south, the country south of uh, Phan Thiet, excluding Saigon, which was controlled by the Capital Military District. As you can see the uh, red there, uh, that's kind of the um, the little red where it says Saigon. That was the special Saigon area, and the red one under it kind of gives you the idea of where the uh, where three core and four core are separated right there. It's, it's kind of fuzzy. Uh, President Dim decided to split the uh, core into two, 
the former three corals area being reduced in size to cover the area northeast of Saigon and newly created four core taking over the west and southwest. And uh, as you can see right above the little arrow that says Benoit, Benoit Air Base, which is where uh, Long Ben was located uh, right next to that. But uh, Saigon was kind of, it's city, Saigon proper was kind of uh, separated as the, care, uh, the capital military district and then rest of that area was, was three core. Uh, which had some of the uh, uh, big name cities in it. Four Corps was the southernmost of the four major military and administrative units in South Vietnam in the 1960s and early 70s. Its headquarters were located at Cantho in the Mekong Delta. Also known as Military Region 4, Four Corps was the fourth Allied tactical combat zone. It consisted of the following provinces Tadak, Tien Phong, Cheng Thuong, Hana, Tianjung, Anjung, Bien Long, Bien Chuang, Long On, and, oh, excuse me, Chuang Pin, Phung Ma, Bien Bin, Tien Hua, Ho Kong, and, and, uh, and Wan, Swan, Lackley, and uh, Bien uh, Ba Swan. Uh, that was probably, well, it wasn't probably, uh, it, was one of the it was the most important area of Vietnam because that's where my, about 75% of all the people and the uh, rice was grown. So, moving along to the next one. Let's see. There we go. Uh, you can see some of the towns and so forth. Uh, Dong Tam was uh, uh, later became the kind of headquarters of 9th Infantry. They were at uh, Bearcat right outside of Long Ben and uh, Benoit and uh, so forth. So, But you can see the map over there with... Um, with the different places broken down so you can kind of get the idea for them. Uh, the line, you can see all the rivers uh, and so forth. So you kind of get the idea that uh, uh, Fort Cora was a lot of water, a lot of, a lot of canals. And I mean, we're talking about narrow canals with uh, just the small boats would be going up and down. Uh, then you had some pretty good sized rivers there. But um, uh, the heavy black line that you see right there, Long and uh, that was the uh, dividing part for the um, uh, four core right up from um, uh, three core. But you can kind of get the idea there. It's almost a peninsula. It's surrounded by ocean, the Gulf of Thailand and the South China Sea uh, kind of come together there. And you can see the Mekong and all its tributaries bringing them. So uh, it was uh, hard to find sometimes a, uh, a lot of land that we walked on there. You can see the DMZ, you can see down the Mekong River Delta in the southeast, Central Highlands, which we talked about, north uh, north central coast. Now, the, green, the dark green and the ones above that, of course, was North Vietnam at the DMZ there. So the land area of Vietnam, north and south, kind of give you an idea of uh, about as far as in South Vietnam as you could go and not drown. Let's see now, let's talk about that area. Because of the nature of its terrain and more important, its geographical isolation from major North Vietnamese strongholds, the Delta area had generally been infiltrated by enemy guerrilla or small force rather than large force brand bands. Thus, except for the Mobile 3, Mobile 3 Riverine Forces and small special forces unit, no U.S. troops had normally operated in the area until Operation Deck House 5 in 1967, when the U.S. 9th Infantry initiated two years of intensive anti-guerrilla activities. Otherwise, uh, MR4 had been and continued to be primary a Vietnamese area of operation uh, or, or uh, zone four. Uh, because of the, uh, the wetness and so forth, uh, it was hard for a large scale um, regular North Vietnamese army to be down in there. So they had to, they did a lot with the, um, the Viet men came in there early. The Mekong Delta has been dubbed a biological treasure trove they have found a thousand animal species, which were recorded between 1997 and 2007, and new species of plants, fish, lizards, and mammals have been discovered in previously unexplored areas, including the Laotian rock rat, thought to be extinct. We well, should be extinct. So there's a lot going on down in the uh, down in the Delta. Uh, the Mekong Delta was likely inhabited long since prehistoric. For centuries, the area was bustling with trading ports and canals as extensive human settlement in the region may have gone back as far as 4th century B.C. 
the, uh, the Delta was because of uh, the uh, agriculture and everything there was uh, inhabited long before a lot of the other places. Uh, the Mekong data as a region lies immediately to the west of Saigon, roughly forming a triangle stretching from Maitho in the uh, Chadok and Hothim in the northwest down to Khao Mau at the southernmost tip of Vietnam, including the islands of Phuc Quoc. And then when we go back again, I can show you the island. The Mekong Delta region of Vietnam displays a variety of physical landscape, but is dominated by flat floodplains in the south with a few hills in the north and west. And we will call them definitely hills. The soil of the lower delta consists mainly of sediment from the Mekong and its tributaries, deposited over thousands of years as the river changed its course due to the flatness of the low lying uh, terrain. And if you ever see the Mekong River, it is very dirty, brown, so it's got a lot of uh, sediment coming down from uh, through Cam Cambodia and so forth. The Mekong Delta is a region with the smallest forest area in Vietnam. Now, you would think with all that uh, water and so forth there, but there's too much water. Uh, it's hard for them to, uh, to grow. 740,000 acres, or 7.7% .7 of the total uh, forest as of 2011. The only province with large forest are Khao Mau province and, and Ken Gang province, together accounting for two-thirds of the region's forest area. While forest covers less than 5% of the area of all the other eight provinces and cities. Being a low-lying coastal region, the Mekong Delta is particularly susceptible, susceptible to floods, resulting from the rise in sea level due to climate changes. Some of the possible consequences of climate change, there, has, there have been predictions out there besides suffering from drought brought on by the seasonal decrease in rainfall, many provinces in the Mekong Delta will be flooded by the year 2030. Uh, it will probably be more than that because it, uh, uh, it's, it's below sea level. Beginning in 1620, a Cambodian king allowed the Vietnamese uh, people to settle in the area and to set up a custom house at uh, Prey Nakor, which they colloquially referred to as Saigon. And that was beginning in 1620s was what we know of as, as Saigon. The increasing Waves of Vietnamese settlers, which followed, overwhelmed the kingdom and slowly Vietnamese the area. So the uh, Vietnamese kind of came in, and with so many people, it just kind of uh, separated itself from Cambodia. In 1698, the Wind Lords of Wei sent a Vietnamese noble to the area to establish Vietnamese administrative structure in the area. This act formally detached the Mekong Delta from Cambodia, placing the region firmly under Vietnamese administrative control. So uh, in 1698, basically, which was a long time ago, uh, the Vietnamese came in and took over. Uh, just again, kind of give you the idea, and uh, I don't see the island there, but you can see some of the rivers again, some of the main cities. Uh, again, that's the full core with all this stuff, and you can see Saigon and uh, Vung Tau, which was a uh, in-country R&R center that I think the Viet Cong used as well as the Americans, but in the Gulf of Siam. So, uh, upon, the end of, uh, uh, upon the end of the Cochina campaign in 1860s, the area became part of Cochina. That's what France uh, called their first colony in Vietnam and later part of the French Indochina. Began during the French colonial period, the French patrolled and fought on the waterways of the Mekong Delta region with their divisions, a tactic which lasted throughout the first Indochina War and was later employed by the U.S. Naval Mobile, Mobile Riverine Force. Uh, life in the Mekong Delta revolves much around the river, and many of the villages are often accessible by rivers and canals rather than by road. A lot of the houses are built right over the river, uh, and as, as you can see here, uh, it's like, uh, give you an example, it's like in Alaska, that sometimes the villages, remote villages, the only way you can get to them is when the rivers froze over and you use the rivers as roads. So that's basically the same way in the Mekong Delta, except they don't freeze over there. In August 2019, instead of using an improved measure of elevation estimation, they found that the delta was much lower than previously estimated, only a mean two feet eight inches above sea level, with 75% 70, of the delta an area where 12 million people currently live, falling below three feet three inches. So you can kind of get the idea during the monsoon season, uh, a lot of those people lived in water. 
12 million people in that little area. Uh, it's not that little, but 12 million people. Uh, today, the inhabitants of the Mekong Delta region are predominantly ethnic Vietnamese. The region formerly part of the Khmer Rouge uh, Empire is also home to the largest population of, of Khmers outside of the modern borders of Cambodia. So they didn't all leave. There is a Khmer minority population, Muslim, and a sizable ethnic Chinese population all in the Delta. Uh, so it's, it's a real uh, melting pot, as we call it. Uh, the Mekong Delta is by far Vietnam's most productive region in agriculture and aquaculture. While its role in industry and foreign direct investment is much smaller. Right now, if you go to Vietnam, uh, the area, three core around Saigon, it's amazing the amount of money and two core that they are putting in uh, roads and so forth, but not a whole lot of extra is being done in, as far as uh, development of the, uh, of the Mekong. During the first Indochina War, which was with the French, uh, with the French colonial power uh, in the Mekong, the worst abuse of tenancy and landlordism prevailed. The Viet Minh found ready support in the village during the years of the war. Throughout this period, the Viet Minh, which was the North Vietnamese uh, guerrillas uh, who fought, uh, basically, the United States uh, trained them how to fight uh, to get rid of the Japanese and, and so forth, uh, lived off the land where they controlled the countryside. They imposed tax burdens and, gain, and grain as heavy as the rentals formerly collected by the landlords. The, a lot of the landlords didn't live down there. They lived in Saigon and so forth, and uh, they so they were not down there, and they just took the half. Uh, these people were like tenant farmers we have in the United States. Uh, they did so not only by, by, by their power to coerce, but also by convincing the peasants they, were rep they represented the cause of national liberation. In other words, they told the peasants they weren't going to throw out the uh, landowners in there, and they could go in and take the land themselves. Though the men, uh, Viet Minh had no specific land program, the, land, the landless were led to believe that the landlord's property would belong to them as soon as the French were defeated. That was uh, the mainstay of the communist movement there. Many landlords had fled, and those who normally lived in Saigon did not dare to venture outside the city. Peasants were encouraged to take over abandoned land and payment of rent as the singers from taxes virtually ceased. In other words, they didn't have to pay rent, but the uh, bit men came in and took uh, uh, as much or more in taxes uh, than they, what the peasants were paying before. Quasi-military religious sects gained control over substantial areas of the Mekong Delta along the Cambodian border. Where, citing traditional concepts of land use, they also encouraged peasants to occupy abandoned land without regard to legal titles. In other words, you just go stay there and grow us stuff and give us half of it or whatever, and there'll be no question about who it belongs to. It was not difficult for the Viet Minh, or the VC, as we knew them, to convince the Mekong Delta inhabitants that the Americans and Saigon government wanted to con just continue the same type of government as the French. Uh, down there, there was not a whole lot of uh, information getting out, so the Viet Minh down there uh, basically told everybody uh, down there, that the Saigon government was the puppet of the Americans, and the Americans were just going to continue just like the French did. Uh, so those who were nationalists, uh, of course, uh, wanted to get the Americans out, and that's how they won a lot of the hearts and minds down in the Delta area. During the Vietnam War or the Second Indochina War, the Delta saw savage fighting between the Viet Cong guerrillas and the U.S. 9th Infantry Division and units of the United States Navy swift boats and hovercrafts, plus the Army of the Republic of Vietnam, 7th and 9th and 21st Divisions. You can see there a hovercraft. I never saw one of those when I was over in, over the Air Force. I didn't get down to the water that much. In the late 1970s, Cambodia under the Khmer Rouge regime attacked Vietnam in an attempt to reconquer the Delta region. This campaign precipitated the Vietnamese invasion of Cambodia and subsequently downfall of the Khmer Rouge. Uh, that was after the killing bills up. But you see the uh, American soldiers on the hovercraft, uh, there's uh, rubber things you see under there filled up with air and, and, went up and they could go uh, pretty, pretty uh, shallow water through there. As the number of Army combat units in Vietnam grew larger, Westmoreland established two corps-sized commands. 
first field forces and then the uh, second field forces area and second field forces in the three core area. Uh, Long Bend was the headquarters of the uh, second field forces. Reporting directly to MACB, which is Military Assistance Command, Vietnam Commander. The field forces commander was the senior Army tactical commander in this area and the senior U.S. advisor to armed forces there. Working closely with the South Vietnamese counterpart, he coordinated Arvin and American operations by establishing territorial priorities for combat and pacification efforts. Uh, that's the, the so the uh, second field forces was in the uh, uh, three core area, but it was also in charge of four core. Uh, okay. Only in four core in the Mekong Delta area where a few American uh, combat units served, Westmoreland chose not to establish a core size command. In other words, like two core. Uh, there, the senior U.S. advisor served as commander, U.S. Military Assistance Command, uh, Com U.S. MACV, a representative. He commanded Army advisor and support units, but no combat units. Patrol and fight in the inundated marshlands and rice paddies and along the numerous canals and waterways crossing the Delta, U.S. Army modernized the concept of riverine warfare employed during the Civil War by Union forces on the Mississippi River and by the French during the Indochina. They went far back in our history to uh, learn how to do it. By 1966, the Vietnam were conducting over a thousand small scale attacks per month on government posts in an isolated village in the Mekong Delta. The Mobile River Reinforce grew out of Westmoreland's desire to reduce these attacks by destroying main force units operating there. The Mobile River Reinforce was conceived as a means of bringing around, uh, make, bringing ground power into a swampy delta interlaced with waterways and rice paddies. Eventually growing to 186 assault craft, the Mobile River Marine Force consisted of a brigade of U.S. Army's 9th Infantry Division and a Navy component called Task Force 117, two river assault squadrons, each with 45 modified landing crafts and other boats. So the, their, the combination of the uh, Army and the Navy working together formed the uh, uh, River Marine, Mobile River Marine Forces. And there's one of their uh, uh, barges, uh, boats that you, you see there in the picture. When U.S. forces received a North Vietnamese supply ship at, at Bung Ro Bay in February 1965, General William C. Morse, Westmoreland, the MACB commander, understood that the U.S. military needed an inshore force in Vietnam, one capable of operating in shallow coastal waters less than six feet in depth. The, Ro the Vung Ro Bay incident demonstrated that North Vietnam was supplying its forces in the south in the uh, south by sea. You can see there that Vung Ro was a little bit ab above the uh, uh, war zone four, but they uh, uh, captured a, a ship there and they realized that the North Vietnam was shipping uh, large uh, uh, amounts of um, supplies down through the, down through both by the ocean through the, these ships. And this is some of the stuff they captured. Uh, the Vung Ro Bay uh, incident showed that North Vietnamese supply and the South Vietnamese Congress with weapons and other materials. You can see it there in some of the pictures. Operation Market Time Task Force 115 was designed to help the Vietnam Navy reduce the North's efforts by interdicting enemy supply ships along the 1,200-mile coastline of South Vietnam. The Vietnam Navy by 1965 possessed 244 vessels and over 8,000 men, but suffered from a variety of ailments, including low morale, a poorly maintained fleet, and young and inexperienced uh, officer corps. Uh, that would create a situation of uh, low morale. They didn't have the, uh, uh, the things they needed. They didn't have the leadership and so forth, but um, which they were kind of... Uh, uh, didn't do, didn't do much good stopping these ships coming in. For years, many American analysts have doubted that the communists were using the sea to supply the forces in the South. But it was until the Vung Ro event that they gained positive proof of such action. The U.S. 7th Fleet Commander Vice Admiral Paul P. Brick Blackburn observed that the Vung Ro 
find was a proof positive. He and General Westmoreland called for a major U.S. Vietnamese anti-infiltration patrol operation. The Allies recovered from the 130-foot North Vietnamese ship and from shore sites 100 tons of Soviet and Chinese-made war materials, including 3,500 to 4,000 rifles. We just saw a picture and submachine guns. 1 million rounds of small arms ammunition, 150 grenades, 2,000 mortar uh, rounds, and 500 pounds of explosives. The Bung Row incident led to the creation of the Market Time Coastal Surveillance Program. Now, that was just off one ship that they, they discovered. There's no telling how many of them were coming in on a regular basis that uh, uh, they had not been seen. Westmoreland believed an infusion of American naval muscle along the coast would not only solve the infiltration problem, but provide the uh, Vietnamese Navy with some breathing space to better train and develop its force. Task Force 115 grew to 5,000 personnel and 126 uh, 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 craft from two services, the U.S. Navy and Coast Guard, deployed along the coast at five separate bases. Now, see, a lot of people don't think about the Coast Guard being in Vietnam, and uh, they were and, and did a great job. Uh, there's Coast Guard is named on the wall. Uh, using a layered approach, maritime patrol aircraft and large surface ships identified and tracked potential infiltrators. Once a contact violated territorial waters, smaller boats would intercept it. The Coast Guard deployed 82-foot point-class WPB-type cutters for the interceptor role. The Navy hastily acquired 50-foot commercial aluminum boats, known as Swift boats, and adopted and adapted them for the mission by adding a variety of weaponry, communications equipment, and radar. We had to redesign everything. As you can see there, they one of the Coast Guard ships that were off the coast in the blue water, and then you got the Navy's 50-foot uh, commercial aluminum boats, known as Swift boats. And I can tell you, if it was aluminum right there, it didn't stop a whole lot of bullets from coming through. But those are two of the boats that were patrolling um, uh, and, and w waiting for word that the ships were coming in, the North Vietnamese ships were coming in and going out and attacking the ships. The U.S. Coast Guard in Vietnam. The U.S. Coast Guard played a vital role in the Vietnam War, but the services combat operation in Southeast Asia remain unknown to most Americans. On April 29, 1965, President Lyndon Johnson signed a memorandum for the president that required U.S. Coast Guard operating forces assist U.S. Naval forces in preventing sea infiltration by the communists in South Vietnam, stating that the U.S. Coast Guard had operating forces which are well suited for, to the mission, but they've been doing it here in the United States for a long time. The same day Johnson signed his memorandum, the service announced formation of Coast Guard Squadron 1. The squadron consists of 26 point class 82 foot patrol boats, which you saw a picture of, and five year one patrol boats could cruise over 4 million miles and inspect over 280,000 vessels. The 82 footers, which were designed for search and rescue and law enforcement, were operating approximately 80% of their time in theater or in South Vietnam. There are eight names from the Coast Guard etched in the Vietnam Memorial Wall. Now, you see that 280,000 vessels, that's anything from a uh, basically a canoe to uh, a good-sized ship. So they uh, definitely stayed busy with their uh, time out there. Operation Market Time pro uh, proved successful in slowing uh, the seaborne infiltration by larger vessels. It became nearly impossible for steel hulk trawlers and junk to penetrate the blockade without being detected by the Navy's highly effective maritime patrol aircraft. The P-2V and the later P-3, and you see the P-2V there in the picture. Um, they pick them up on radar. They fly over it and, and decide who they were. Once found, cutters and Navy patrol crafts, fast swift boats, engaged the vessels relying on speed and availability of fire support from larger vessels and aircraft to make up for their thin skins and light armament. By March 1968, North Vietnam had greatly curtailed its trawler operations along the coast, and market time could boast of a 94% success rate in stopping steel hull infiltrators. To be able to couldn't use the same thing, the same idea on the Ho Chi Minh Trail, but we did stop it from the ocean pretty much. Market time also provided Navy inshore warfare planners with a valuable lesson that would later be applied to riverine operations. Lesson one was that to survive in a firefight with a dug-in ground force, 
Small boats either had to be very fast or heavily armored. Both approaches would be tried and with varying degrees of success later in the war. Another lesson was that every brown water sailor had to possess a set of unique war fighting skills, not generally found in the fleet. These included com uh, competition with light weapons, advanced first aid, and small boat handling. And in 1967, the Navy established a Navy Inshore Operations Training Center at uh, Mare Island in California to teach these skills to sailors assigned to coastal and riverine units in Vietnam. They'd always been used to uh, dealing with uh, pretty good sized ships. And now they're out there, what, uh, what we would um, call before uh, the war would be like um, uh, uh, individual boats. And now we're, they're having to use them going up and down the rivers. Totally different than what they were used to in the ocean, blue water. Black Operation Market Time before it, Game Warden, the Navy's patrol operation developed larger in response to the deficiencies of the Vietnamese Navy. For much of the war, Vietnam and the Navy's riverine Boats were employed mainly to ferry and resupply Army of the Republic of uh, uh, Vietnam units rather than deny the enemy of the use of South Vietnamese rivers. The Mekong Delta alone contains over 3,000 miles of waterways. 3,000 miles of waterways. MACB could not hope to defeat the insurgency without establishing some semblance of government control there. Consequently, 120 a uh, boat U.S. Navy River Patrol Force called Task Force 116 was established in December of 1965 to assist the Vietnam Navy in patrolling the main rivers of the Mekong Delta plus the Saigon shipping channels running through the Rungsat Swamp. Rungsat Swamp was another special area we'll talk about another time. The Navy adapted a commercially built 31-foot-long fiberglass pleasure boat for the river patrol, replacing screws with water jets adding machine guns for armament at a cost of $75,000 per unit. That was a bargain. Uh, the patrol boat's river PBRs was a cost-effective and innovative application of the off-the-shelf technology to a military role. Uh, basically, the reason they went to the uh, uh, water jets, because that way the props wouldn't get fouled up in the, uh, in the uh, mud and the grass and so forth, the swamps that get into much, much heavy area. But that is a PBR. You see there in the picture. Uh, they were configured a lot of different ways, but um, PBR is capable of speeds in excess of 25 knots, search suspicious watercraft, enforcing curfews, and occasion disrupted uh, communist troop movement. Organized initially into five divisions, the PBRs operated from both dry land bases and landing ships, or LST. In 1966, the Navy brought four World War II-era LSTs out of mothballs and modified them for brown water Navy operations. The LSTs contain small boat repair facilities, a cable communication suite, 40 millimeter guns, and a medical facilities. For the river rats, they also offer clean air conditioning berthing and familiar Navy chow. One of the most significant features of these afloat bases were helicopter pads. Helicopters evacuated wounded and, and provided PBRs with reconnaissance and fire support. During the war, the Navy developed a light helicopter attack squadron specifically for riverine operations. Now, these LSTs were like floating barracks. So the, after patrolling, the Navy could come back in and have Navy food, relax a little bit, uh, some air conditioning, um, and so forth. So, and then they had, had the helicopter pads, so it gave, gave them a chance for a break. Uh, the large number of small boats attached to Task Force 116 meant enlisted petty officers often served as boat captains, a huge change in Navy accustomed to only allowing officers to command units. The same would be true in the Mobile Riverine Force. In most cases, these enlisted boat captains exceeded expectations. Many provided to be fierce warriors and received some of the nation's top combat wars, including the Medal of Honor and Navy Cross. While a mere 120 PBRs, patrol boats, rivers, could not hope to create an effective interdiction, a barrier along the numerous waterways of the Mekong Delta, they did provide strong naval presence on its main rivers and the shipping channels in the Rungsat zone, which is right out of Saigon. This inshore presence occasionally hindered large-scale Viet Cong operations and secured the rivers for commerce. I mean, some of the some of the canals and rivers and so forth 
was so small that uh, you could go down and touch the uh, foliage on both sides, which is one of the reasons that Agent Orange was starting to spray in that area. There's one of the barrack ships. Uh, the Mobile Grove Marine Force utilized a joint Navy Army Navy task force controlled by a ground commander in contrast to amphibious operations, where control re reverts to the ground commander only after the, uh, the force is ashore. River Marine warfare, uh, warfare was an extension of land combat with infantry units traveling by water rather than by trucks or uh, track vehicles. Aided by Navy, uh, Navy River Support Squadron and a River Assault Squadron, infantrymen were held on barrack ships and supported by gunships or fire support boats called monitors. Howards and mortars mounted on barges provided artillery support. Now, those uh, ships, as you saw, they were very vulnerable to um, the Viet Cong sappers would come in and blow them up. So uh, there were people who periodically would throw grenades over the side to make sure that uh, there was nobody swimming up to uh, uh, blow the boat up. The only riverine boat developed completely from scratch during the war was the assault support boat. Designed to be the uh, Mobile Riverine Force's destroyer. It was a combination escort, patrol boat, minesweeper. The boat could achieve speeds up to 14.8 knots and contained lightweight armor capable of protecting the crew against the 57 millimeter recoilless rounds and bullets up to 50 caliber in size. Uh, it had some pretty good armor then. While its sailors would have appreciated more speed and armor capable of withstanding the direct hits from large caliber rockets. No other riverine platforms uh, offered such capability and versatility. That was the assault support boat. That is an assault uh, 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 support boat. You can see it's got more armor on it, uh, a little bit different setup from some of the others that we've talked about. Uh, but that's them going up in the river. Uh, like Task Force 116, the mobile uh, riverine force employed modified LSTs and similar vessels as mobile bases. It also developed a massive dry land base uh, called Dongtown near Mytho. Build the facility engineers had to fill over 600 acres of rice paddies with landfill. Biggest reclamation project of the war. By mid-1967, Dongtown occupied 12 square kilometers. Uh, that's where the 9th Infantry moved and had their headquarters there uh, after they left Bearcat. General Westmoreland placed all U.S. Army forces conducting uh, riverine operations on the 9th Infantry Division commander, who would exercise control by the commanders of the 2nd Brigade, Brigade U.S. Navy Riverine Forces, would be under the operational control of the commander of Naval Forces, uh, Vietnam, who would exercise their control through the command of Task Force 117. So as long as they were on the boat, uh, the Navy was in charge, but once they set foot on the ground, the, the 9th Infantry uh, Commander who was was there and commanding the unit uh, was in charge. You can see Westmoreland there with his uh, uh, infantry patch on. Uh, this is some of the uh, patches that were the 9th Infantry had and some of the patches there. This is just a few of them. In practical terms, this meant each service in the Mobile Marine Force would retain command of its own force. Joint bases, whether on land or afloat, might be under the command of the senior army commander assigned. When the Mibarine force weighed anchor, the Navy component commander would assume control until the movement was over. During combat, a similar arrangement prevailed. Troops and landing craft would be under Navy's control while in transit. But as soon as the troops landed, the army commander would regain control. You can see right there the Mobile Riverine force. Uh, Mobile Riverine Force in the Mekong Delta, then you see the 9th Infantry, Mobile Riverine Force, 2nd Brigade, and then you had the River Rats and so forth. But this is like, this kind of give you an idea of what it was like to patrol and work in the uh, Mekong Delta. As you can see there, uh, the infantry guys crossing the river, uh, they had to make them a little um, uh, barge there, a little uh, thing to support their stuff as they uh, swam it across the, uh, across the river. You can see is the uh, PBR going through um, uh, the small canals and so forth. Uh, you know, you got guys on both sides of the river there shooting at you. Uh, it can get kind of tough. That's one of the reasons that uh, Admiral Zumwalt encouraged the spraying of Agent Orange through there. Uh, you see another guy fighting in the mud uh, there. That's because uh, wherever you were, you're going to be in the mud. 
Uh, it's dry socks was a real uh, wonderful thing there. And this is a picture of some of the people who are living on the Mekong River. Uh, it's just it's just like that today. Uh, you see the little boy down there, his shiny hiney. Uh, he is probably taking a dump there in the river. And right next to him, probably what you can't see is Mama Son filling up a bucket to go cook dinner. And right next to that, maybe another Mama Son washing clothes. I mean, the Mekong River serves everything. Uh, sewage, water, drinking, everything. As you can see, going down the flat boats uh, down through the Mekong River, it's beautiful through there. Uh, I have been through there on one of those boats. Uh, so uh, even even the wounded soldiers are coming out, they had to wade. And you can see them carrying the stretcher there. Uh, this kind of gives you the idea of what it was like to fight down in the Mekong Delta area. Uh, it was hard to find a place that you were dry. Again, you can see one of the boats uh, come up on the land there. Uh, that's the Mekong River. You can tell by how nice and brown the water is. Uh, coming up to one of the village houses. Probably going to check it out. There's some soldiers getting ready to cross the river. It's also evidently monsoon season there because, uh, as you can see, they're wet all over. You can see a guy out there holding his rifle up to kind of keep it out of the water. Because he very may well step in a hole and be over his head. A um, little different fighting the Mekong River than it was in I Corps. Uh, also, some of the wildlife there, uh, it looked like crocodiles to me. Uh, so between the leeches and the crocodiles and other things that are in the water, uh, you can see houses built right out on the water. Uh, you can tell during the monsoon season, a lot of these houses are going to be underwater. In fact, back where that first bush right there starts, looks to me like that house is underwater. Uh, they're built on, stil on stilts, but it um, didn't make any difference once the, once the floods start coming in and starts coming into the house. So even those cities right there, now they have uh, floating markets. Uh, you can pull up on your boat because all the boats are tied together and they've got just about anything you want. It's going like going uh, to the supermarket uh, and it's floating on the water. Uh, as you can see there, even the uh, news media who went out, not very much, but went out with the soldiers. They're having to cross the water there. Uh, top picture right there is one of my favorite things is leeches. You can see there that uh, that's a pretty good sized leech. And if you were down in the water, I guarantee you, you're going to get leeches on you. Uh, they wouldn't kill you, but I tell you what, they were yucky, and they would suck your blood. Uh, then down picture, you see one of the boats uh, and so forth. So that kind of gave you an idea of what it was like to fight the war uh, down in the Mekong Delta. Uh, Mekong Delta, 1968 Tet Offensive, uh, the famous Tet Offensive. Uh, on the first night of Tet, uh, the Viet Cong units attacked nearly every major city and town in the Mekong Delta, including Matho, Ben Tre, Ben Long, and Can Tho. Except for small pockets of allied resistance, often at bases or Billington compounds, most of these towns were completely overrun. The Delta's defenders included three Arvin divisions, but over half of these troops were on leave for the Tet holiday. Effectively, this meant that a large portion of the fighting would fall upon the U.S. Army's 9th Division and Naval Force. Riverine units performed two basic functions during the attack, mobile firepower and transport for Army troops. Give you back up to date a little bit so you understand. Doing Tet, up until that time, there was always a ceasefire on both sides because Tet was the most important holiday of the uh, Vietnamese people. And there was always a uh, ceasefire there. The North Vietnamese celebrated Tet a couple of days early. So almost all the South Vietnamese were off on, on a Tet holiday because it was always a, uh, a downside which gave the, uh, the Viet Cong the ability to come in. And uh, they attacked more, it looks like, to me like, looks like they attacked more of the towns in uh, Mekong than they did some of the other places, uh, but they tried not to attack places where the Americans were too much. Uh, you can see Cantho there, where the, uh, was one of the battles, Ben Long going up, Mytho, uh, Kenwa. Those are some of the places that were attacked there. Uh, you can see most of them were north of the, uh, the Mekong River coming down uh, and so forth. But uh, the Cantho was right on the line. Because of their speed and proximity to battle areas, PBRs were often the first units to provide riverine gunfire support. At Bantre, a city of close to 75,000 in the capital of Kenwa province, 
The Viet Cong attacked early in the morning of January 31st, hoping to capture the city quickly and use it as a base for further operations in the area. Until units from the Mobile River Marine Force arrived at Ben Trey late in the day of February 1st, PBRs, Patrol Boat Rivers, and Allied aircraft were the only outside help the beleaguered defenders there received. Without U.S. assistance, Ben Trey's defenders may not have survived the initial onslaught. During the battle, even support ships engaged in the firefight. Those are big ships off the coast uh, who could fire their big guns. The LST Harnett County 40 millimeter mounts delivered over 20,000 rounds in the Ben Trey area just by itself. At MIFO, where an estimated 1,200 Viet Cong fighters attacked, uh, the PBRs, patrol boat rivers, roamed the canals in the area, killing large amounts of enemy troops. Sailors trapped in Billington hotels along with SEALs fought the Viet Cong on the ground. SEALs attached to Task Force 116 managed the effort, providing on-the-spot infantry training to rear echelon sailors more accustomed to uh, manning tight riders than the M16s. In other words, on these ships, you had a lot of uh, type, uh, uh, supply people, uh, clerk typists, and so forth, who were not used to being out and fighting. But uh, during Tet, a lot of, like, almost everybody became an infantry guy. The title of Battle of Matho uh, changed dramatically with the arrival of M Mobile River Marine Force units late in the afternoon of February 1st. Within hours of the Mobile River Marine Force's arrival, the Viet Cong were abandoning their positions and moving out of the provincial capital. Overall, the Viet Cong lost over 115 soldiers, perhaps as many as 400 in Mytho, or Mytho, excuse me. By comparison, the Mobile Marine Force lost three soldiers and, and the Arvin lost 25. So they made a big difference when they came in. A smaller pattern of events occurred at Ventre, where they were just three days after the Mobile River Marine Force arrived, the city was liberated and Ben Long, where most Viet Cong resistance was crushed in two days by units of the Mobile Marine Force. The feet of the Viet Cong at Mytho, Ben Trey, and Ben Long, as well as in such as in much of Saigon by the second week of February, allowed the Allies to focus more resources in the battles near the DMZ zone in I Corps. At Wei and Dong Ha, riverine units assigned to Task Force Clearwater in I Corps and naval support activities succeeded for all but a few brief periods in to keep uh, supplies flowing. Uh, Dong Ha and Wei. Uh, were tough for the Marines uh, there. It took them a while to get them out. One reason, at way, at way, they didn't want to destroy the city since it was an imperial city going back into the beginning of Vietnam. And so they went in there to start with, let's don't bomb it and so forth. Uh, so uh, Marines had to fight door to door. Due to its remote location, uh, let's see, it was more difficult to defend than other towns in the Delta. The thought a potential attack by a force of 2,500 Viet Cong, the Mobile River Marine Force had to make a 110-mile journey from Dong Tam to Quoc Dam Providence, one of the largest transits of the war for the force. It took the Mobile River Marine Force far from its normal supply lines and the better part of two days to make the transit. In other words, if you don't have supplies, food, water, ammunition, uh, it can get tough, but uh, they went, went in to liberate uh, the town. Okay. The key to the success of American arms throughout the Mekong during Tet was the Mobile Marine Force's ability to move significant forces to battle areas before the Viet Cong could, could consolidate the initial gains. The Mobile River Marine Force transported forces to battlefields in eight provinces in February and sustained them once the battles were joined by providing gunfire support, a significant asset during Tet when aviation artillery assets were in short supply and ammunition, food, water, and medical aid were also in short supply. The logistics support provided by the Army by the Mobile River Marine Force cannot be overstated. While the 2nd Brigade 9th Division could insert small numbers of troops into the areas by helicopter, supplying operations for long periods with air sets alone was beyond its capacity. While the Mobile River Marine Firepower for logistics supports and amphibious uh, capability provided by the Make Mobile River Marine Force has allowed Westmoreland to quickly reverse the Viet Cong gangs and turn his attention to the battles occurring near the, de the military zone in I-Corps. And other units also contributed mighty to the efforts uh, in the Delta, which was, uh, if you think back, it was uh, a lot going on in Quezon. Uh, some Army of the Republic of Vietnam and Vietnam Navy units fought extremely hard in certain areas. 
especially Mytho and Ben Long. Task Force 116 PBRs and air power from all the services also play a significant role in providing fire support for defenders early in the struggle. The fight for the Delta was a joint and combined arms effort. Fighting a war in the Mekong Delta required some innovative ideas and some trial and error. Uh, it was kind of new to us, so there was a lot of... Uh, uh, things try and a lot of things work and the things that you go, nah, but they work anyway. The entire region is covered with swamps, rivers, streams, and canals that severely hampered land movement and placed hardships on ground troops assigned to fight there. Roads were almost non-existent. The little dry land that did exist was often inhabited by the local population. Setting up viable bases, therefore, usually meant encroaching on their territory. Not a popular move in the struggle to win the hearts and minds. In order to fight effectively in the Delta and provide the infantry with critical field art artillery support, the Army had to learn by trial and error and innovate on the fly. In other words, the big guns were uh, out there. They had a problem there, though. The Mobile River Marine Force consisted of 2nd Brigade of the uh, U.S. Army's uh, 9th Infantry and U.S. Navy's River Marine Assault Force. Uh, one, this unit employed a combination of naval riverine craft, landing craft, and helicopters in its missions against the Viet Cong operating in the area. The support of field artillery was as essential in the Delta as any other area. In order to provide this support, the assigned units went through a series of experiments and trials, uh, culminating in the creation of specialized riverine artillery batteries. These batteries, their cannons mounted on barges could be moved readily along the various waterways and positions where ever needed to be support the maneuvers and units on shore. Once in place, the guns provided fast, accurate fire. When the mission was over, the guns were moved to the next firing point. It was an efficient, workable answer, but they had to go through a whole lot to get there. The Mekong Delta's environment hindered both the field artillery operations and infantrymen who had uh, to slog through its swamps and rice paddies. In the Delta, even ground considered dry is only so uh, in a relative sense because the water table is very high. This, uh, in turn, makes it ever uh, even dry earth soft. In place, artillery and soft ground not only makes firing operations difficult for the crew, but also can quickly degrade the accuracy of the guns. And if you're calling in for uh, fire support, you do not want the uh, accuracy of the guns to be degraded. Cannon batteries are set up uh, for firing by use of a device called aiming circle. This instrument ensures that all the guns are pointing in exactly the same direction. Such position, uh, position enables the entire battery to shoot accurately over long distance using one set of firing calculations, normally efficient procedure. Now, they may be miles from the infantry guys who needed the, um, uh, needed su the support of the guns uh, but all of them could fire at the same coordinates that were given to them on radio and end up doing the, uh, hitting the same spot. However, conditions of Delta reduced this accuracy and efficiency. After firing a few rounds, a 10-ton howitzer would begin to sink into the soft ground, disrupting the careful alignment of the sights. When the artillery was firing at targets thousands of meters away, as they almost always were, even a small move of the cannon was enough to throw the trajectory of the round dozens or even hundreds of meters off target. At best, that reduced the effect of the firing on the enemy. At worst, it caused rounds to land short, killing and wounded Americans or Vietnamese troops, which we call friendly fire, which is not so friendly. This shifting also made traversing the gun more, much more difficult. The main Precision gun crews had to make almost constant corrections for accuracy, which slowed down the response to calls for fire from the infantry. And the limited road network made resupply complicated. The few existing roads had to be shared with troops and were vulnerable to ambush. There were some places where guns could be set up, but they were, uh, were um, at, well enough to provide the amount of fire support needed. The troops' first approach to solving this problem was to create firm ground for themselves and use an air transportable firing platform. This was a 22 by 22 foot square with four adjustable legs. The legs were detachable so that if they could became stuck in the muck, 
the platform could be lifted back off without them and the legs recovered later. The firing platforms were flown in by a CH-47 Chinook helicopter and placed wherever needed. A second helicopter then landed an M-102-105 howitzer with ammunition direct onto the platform. If a C-854 helicopter was available, it could also lift the cannon, some ammunition, and platform all in one trip. But you had a basic problem with that. Uh, even that had a tendency to sink. And uh, let me see. I can show you what they look like. Just a moment here. All right, there's one There's one of the guns. There's one of the uh, units there. Uh, they raised them up above the river. But after a few shots, even as, as much as they are, I would think those were things were starting to uh, uh, sink. But there's always another problem there. While the air, air transport platform did provide a solution, it was not a perfect one. Although steady enough to enable accurate firing, it was too small to hold the crew's equipment and all the ammunition needed for the extended firing. More important, the crew was essentially sitting on a raised table and exposed to small arms fire. Gun crews often rigged the platform's edge with sandbags, but a better solution was needed. Of course, American ingenuity. The next innovation was to mount the howitzers on a watercraft uh, that made them mobile, less vulnerable to the enemy fire and easier to resupply. Uh, the first vessel adapted for artillery uh, use was the landing craft mechanized. That was a 56-foot long steel hull boat was adapted to be the 1st Battalion, the 7th Artillery to carry 105 how, uh, towed howitzers in the cargo bay, along with 450 rounds of ammunition. But special bracing was added to absorb the shock of the cannon's recoil. The landing craft could move under its own power to wherever needed, anchor itself to the river bank, and begin firing. The design worked, but it had its limitations. It was still not as stable a platform as the cannon required, and getting the gun into action took time in the cramped space of the cargo bay. The cargo bay was too narrow for the gun's trails to be up, open fully, limiting how far the gun could traverse when firing. In other words, you can't, you can't fire one way and then turn around and fire the other way real quick. The most successful floating artillery platform was a floating barge. It was the brainchild of two officers of the 3rd Battalion, 34th Artillery. Uh, they experimented with Navy's pontoons to carry howitzers. The first trial used a large pontoon barge called an, uh, an Amity barge to carry a 105 and work, but its deep draft hampered movement. The next experiment was to connect small pontoons to create a usable barge with a sufficient shadow draft. The Navy's standard pontoon was a seven foot by five foot model. They could be connected. The artillery barge consisted of enough pontoons to make up a barge 90 feet long and just over 28 feet wide. You can see it right there. Uh, our armor plating was welded around the edges, and in the middle were living quarters for the gun crew. On each side of, the of these quarters were platforms that held 105 howitzers, and at each end of the barge was storage space for ammunition. An entire six-gun battery could be carried on three such barges. One landing craft towed or pushed the gun barges to their firing points. Another carried ammunition, and the third was the battery's command post and fire direction. A battalion command post with the helicopter landing pad was also created. As you can see, the guns there, they can fire in any direction. You still got a place for the boat, and you also got the uh, supplies for the uh, uh, guns. The barges were pushed to a selected firing point as close as possible to the supported unit. Being as close as possible to the action meant the guns could range the target within the lowest possible firing charge, which increased the life of the gun barrels. It was preferable to finding a section of riverbank clear of vegetation so the helicopters could land supplies. It also, uh, by clear of vegetation, it was hard for the bad guys to hide. Uh, the barges were moored on the opposite bank from the battle area to keep the resupply helicopters behind the direction of firing. Winches, mooring lines, and grappling hooks secured the barges. The equipment was used to lay and aim the guns, the aiming stakes or uh, culminators, and the aiming circle which put ashore on the bank stakes out so the guns would know what how to, to calculate. Within a tet, with the Tet Offensive that began in January 1968, the Riverine Force was sent to Mytho area, where three Viet Cong battalions were, were trying to capture the province cavalry at Ben Long. 
The 30 to 34th artillery fired 8,158 rounds during the fight to support the infantry. After Tet, the 30 to 34th traveled in various waterways of the Mekong, taking part in numerous fire missions. Occasionally, helicopters lifted howards off their barges to be employed inland. In September 1968, batteries such as three mortar attacks, an ambush, and a mine attack. The Mekong Delta in its war was just like a war within a war. It was just like everybody else, but it was different. It was different in, 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 in the water situation and having to work and so forth. Uh, coming up, our next show is Veterans Day. If you're in the Raleigh, Wake County area, uh, you're invited to a ceremony at 11 o'clock on November 11th at the North Carolina State Capitol Building on, on 1 East Eden Street. It will start at 1 o'clock. Uh, it's open to all veterans. Just wear your mask and keep social distance. There'll be an honor guard, 21-gun salute, guest speakers, Raleigh Vet Center mobile units. If you uh, need someone to talk to or work on any claim, the uh, Vet Center uh, mobile unit will be, will be there. This event is organized the Wake County Council of Veterans Organizations. Uh, so that's coming up on the 11th. Uh, as you, most of you know, uh, this weekend we uh, fall back. Daylight savings time. Uh, everybody's excited about having another day and another hour in 2020. Uh, but don't forget to turn your clocks back. Uh, be sure to tell a Marine happy birthday on the 10th. That's the Marine's birthday. Uh, be sure and get them a box of crayons for their birthday. Uh, let's see. A most, another important thing is 3rd of November. We will start, hopefully by then, we will stop being inundated in the mail, news, my mailbox stays full. My emails stay full. It's election day. If you haven't already voted, go vote. I'd like to tell you how to vote, but you go vote the way your heart feels. Uh, I'm, a, I'm an extreme conservative. I, I fought against uh, socialism and communism. But you go vote whichever way your heart goes, And but just go vote. It may be January before we know who actually won the election. But go vote anyway. So that's 3rd of November. Go vote. Let's see. On the 7th of November, the POWMI ceremony, which has been held for the last 33 years, will be held at 12 o'clock noon at the state capitol at the uh, Vietnam Memorial there. Let's see. The uh, Also, the 11th of November, Veterans Day. It's okay, by the way, to go out and tell people, happy Veterans Day. Uh, I hope you know the difference between Veterans Day and Memorial Day. We'll talk about that in our next show, which is Veterans Day. But I hope you have a, uh, a good week, what's remainder, and have a good strong end. Negative people have weekends. But thank you for tuning in. Tell all your friends about us, and we'll look forward to seeing you on Veterans Day. Good night. You are tuned to the Nissan Communications Network. If you tuned in too late, you can always watch each program in its entirety or download an MP3 audio file of it in the archive section at nissancommunications.com. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel, follow us on Twitter, and like us on Facebook. Sponsored by Telestream's Wirecast Software, StreamingGear.com, Carolina Apparel, and DeltaForce.net.